All right, our topic today actually was generated a little over a year ago initially when uh, uh, I was asked to respond to something uh, that had been posted on CNN related to the historical reliability of Genesis, to which my first reaction is, Genesis is not in the New Testament. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so, uh, so in the midst of trying to respond, I sent uh, uh, SOS emails to my colleagues here uh, in, in the Old Testament department, and it began a discussion that involved um, camels, primarily, but then in the midst of the conversation, in snuck water wells and Philistines. Okay, now it's not exactly the normal thing you think of when you put a trinity together. So, <laughs> so, um, so we've kind of nicknamed this chapel as Lions, Tigers, and Bears, oh my. And uh, it's just kind of a different way to introduce everybody. We thought of this, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> camels, Gre Greeks, and I don't know what that, be ears? Be ears, be ears be oh my, so. Not beers. No. Okay, that's right. So I'm you noting that only one of the guys has hair. <laughs> that's ex <laughs> exactly right, yeah. And the question is, how did that happen? Yeah. But anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so, we're, so our topic today, in case you can't tell, is reliability uh, in the book of Genesis. And uh, you know my, <laughs> my guests here, uh, uh, Gordon Johnson and That's Bob hilarious. Chisholm, with whom we've worked together for, for years. And so we're just going to dive in and kind of get started. And um, Gordon, why don't you help us talk about the nature of the problem? What do these three areas share? Okay. They're all, they're, it's what's called anachronisms or alleged anachronisms. Uh, we've got another slide, we'll illustrate this in a minute. But the three alleged anachronisms, these are things in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, in the 70s, there was a song. I was in the right place, but it must have been the wrong time. <laughs> Remember that? Okay, these are things that, okay, well, no, you're too young. No, okay. no, Gordy. <laughs> We need to work on culture, engagement, and connection, that. okay? I, I, guess, I guess I'm the anachronism. <laughs> That's exactly right, exactly. <laughs> it's like George Washington driving a Cadillac. Yeah, That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got camels, <laughs> Abraham riding camels, Abraham digging wells, and Abraham encountering Greeks or Philistines in Canaan. Critical scholars are going to argue those are things at the wrong time at the wrong place. All right, and so just to illustrate what historical <laughs> anachronism looks like, there it is. The, the question I want to ask you guys is, what is Abe listening to? Do you know who he's listening to? Uh, late 50s doo-wop. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, so let's roll on here. And uh, here, here's a little more realistic picture of the nature of the problem. Uh, the, the book of Genesis has the patriarchs uh, riding camels, so um, kind of the original edition of the Kentucky Derby. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so let's talk our way through this. Let's talk about camels first. Okay. Uh, Genesis has the patriarchs riding camels quite a bit, uh, <laughs> but Abraham gets his camels down in Egypt. Okay, that's an important point. Uh, critical scholars, you can click that for us. Okay. General. Critical scholars are going to argue, though, that camels don't come in to the Middle East until about a thousand years after Abraham. Okay, we've got uh, we've got uh, the black what's called the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser, about 850 B.C. You can see camels that are on it, but that's about a thousand years after Abraham, and this is one of the earliest examples that we had of camels. You've got ancient Near Eastern texts that talk about camels about a thousand B.C. in Assyria. So for the longest time, uh, they were arguing that, that the Bible is wrong on this, that uh, the camels in, the, in Genesis are about 1,000 years too early. Okay, so, um, uh, and obviously that's not where things stand now. Am I right about no, that? No, no, and so what happened was, uh, just a couple years ago, two Israeli scholars uh, were excavating at Timnah, and they found camel bones, it's one hump camel bones, um, it's called dromedary. So wait, we, we, we aren't camel experts here, right? Okay, so, so there's two types of camels. Okay, there we go. All and this, right. is, this is important. You got all right, all two right. types of camels, one hump camels This is, you can tell camels. people what you learned in chapel today, okay? <laughs> all right, go ahead. Yeah, there's actually people that study this kind of stuff. Okay, um, yeah, that, they're sick. Yeah, they are. <laughs> you know, you appreciate them, but... That's right. <laughs> so these two Israeli scholars found at Tim, it's a site in Israel, they've got one hump camels, but the first time that they're there is about 1,000 B.C. 
So they argue, so the, the blog, internet blog went crazy that these Israeli archaeologists have proven that the Bible's wrong, that camels don't exist in Israel to about 1000 BC. And that's true for one hump camels. <laughs> now, for me, you know, Daryl as well, you know, a camel's a camel. Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew Bible, a camel's a camel. No, 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 a camel's not a camel. Camels. There are different kinds of there camels. There are different kinds of That's camels. That's right, okay. And you've got, whoops, here we go. You've got two types of camels. One hump camels and two hump camels. This is so you get it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, th this is important. Guy in right. This is important. One hump ham camels were late, two hump camels were early. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it take them a thousand years to lose a hump. That's that right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. So we've got two hump camels in Egypt about 12,000 BC. That's way before Abraham. You've got two hump camels in uh, all throughout the ancient Near East by 7,000 BC. And two hump camels are domesticated by about 3,000 BC. That's about a thousand years before Abraham. Okay, so what, what's happening in the popular press and in mainstream scholarship is that they're not making a distinction between one hump camels and two hump camels. <laughs> now, one hump camels were for trade, uh -huh. two hump camels were for travel. Okay, so T and T, right? T and I mean, that T. Even, you can That's preach that. You can preach that. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> so when you, when you think about Abraham, was, was Abraham a, a caravaner doing trade, bringing product in with one hump camels? was using two hump camels to trade, or to, to travel. He was traveling, and where does he get his camels? He gets his camels in Egypt. You got these two hump camels in Egypt, 12,000 BC. 10,000 years before they need to be. Okay. So we got plenty of time. Got plenty of time. <laughs> we got plenty of time. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, and then I've got some bibliography if you're interested. Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Take notes quickly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Like, okay. Now, move on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we not only have the archaeology, but we also have ancient Near Eastern texts. We've got texts from the time of Abraham, from Nippur, from Ugarit, from Allah. These are all area, uh, from the time of Abraham that talk about two hump camels. Okay, so it's not just the archaeology. We've got texts. Uh, we've also got rock art carvings and drawings. This is from Egypt. That looks like two humps to me. That looks like two humps. Yeah. That's, about, that's a thousand years before Abraham. Oh, wow. Now, this one's a little bit harder to see. This <laughs> is a seal, a cylinder seal. In the circle, there are two seated deities that are riding on the two humps of a two-hump camel. <laughs> okay, that dates to about the time of Abraham. They're actually able to have a conversation with one another. It's kind of ancient Uber. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not sitting in the middle, they're, they're yeah. Uber on top. Two yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, even if somebody says, well, now we're special pleading, you know, you're pleading for two hump camels. We've also got one hump camels in Egypt as well <laughs> before the time of Abraham. This is a rock art drawing. It's petroglyph uh, from Egypt a couple hundred years before Abraham. You've got a domesticated camel, one hump camel being led about by an Egyptian. How do you find out about this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a very boring life. <laughs> no, he doesn't. You know, we office by the counseling uh, department. <laughs> so sometimes, I, I, a couple months ago, I was out at dinner with my wife, and we were talking, and I started talking to her about camels. I was all excited about No, that. tell me it's not so. And she said, does anyone really care? <laughs> <laughs> we do. You know, do. I have a similar story about the document Q with my wife. Yeah. Okay. Who or what is Q and who really cares? That's what she said That's to me. That's exactly Okay, right. all right. So I feel your pain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's camels. So that's camels. Okay, so cam camels down. Okay, so next up we've got, is it water wells? Water wells. Okay, water wells. now what is it about okay. water? It's been a long time since I've thought about a water well. Yes. Okay. We're going to talk about wells all over the place. Okay, okay. all right. Okay. So? So with wells, we've got Abraham digging wells. Okay. Oh, the Hebrew got messed up there. That's fine. Yeah. Genesis 21 oh, yeah. and Genesis 26, Abraham is digging wells. Okay. That's how Hebrew looks to most students. <laughs> That's right. Oh, uh, no, don't, don't say it. Don't, don't say it ain't so, Joe. I'm sorry to pain you. <laughs> say it ain't so, Joe. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Now, okay. when you see the word well, it's the Hebrew word be'ir. Not so. Camels, tigers, and bears, be'ir. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, when you see the word well, we're, most of us are thinking about the traditional well, stones with the pulley and the bucket, right? Okay. Sure. I mean, I think about that all the That's time. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, when you think about it. That's right. When? <laughs> when? <laughs> We're going to make you think about <laughs> That's it. Exactly. Okay. 
That's not, the, the, the word well can mean that. The word well can also simply mean watering hole that you dig out in the middle of the, of the, of the ground. So when it talks about Abraham digging wells, are we talking about a traditional well? Or are we talking about a beer, a, a hole in the ground without all the paraphernalia? Uh, now, Abraham dug this well. Water wells come with accessories? They come with accessories. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. all right. Um, he's got this well. We're told that he, he built the well near Beersheba. Okay, now, uh, in the 1950s, uh, Israeli archaeologist Yahon uh, Aharoni excavated Beersheba. And he said, but Genesis has got to be wrong because Beersheba was not built until a thousand years after Abraham. And he found a city well there in a cistern that was not built until about 700 BC. So he argues that Beersheba's late, the well there at Beersheba's late, so the book of Genesis is fabricating like, like Abe Lincoln with the noise box. <laughs> Okay, here's the picture of Beersheba, the two arrows, the cistern that I'll show you a picture of, and then the well. Here's the cistern. It's a massive cistern. Okay, lots that of water. is a water well. That's a water well, yeah. yeah. Abraham mm -hmm. certainly couldn't have built this, about 700 BC. Mm -hmm. Here is the reconstructed well at the city of Beersheba. So the question is, did, is the Bible claiming that Abraham, that Beersheba was in existence at the time of Abraham when the well was there, or does it talk about Abraham digging a hole, a water hole, where the city later rose up. Okay, now, uh, the word uh, for well, ear sometimes refers to simple pits in the ground, sometimes refers to holes in the ground dug by nomads, sometimes but rarely refers to a traditional well. So based upon the number of times it's used and in Genesis, like we're talking about a hole in the ground, and we're not talking about a city, because Abraham and Isaac dwelt in what? They dwelt in tents. It never claims that there was a city there were dwelling in tents. Okay, here's an example of a Be'ir. Matter of fact, this site is actually called Be'ir Otayim, two wells. That's not our traditional well. This is, this is about 2,000 years before Abraham. Here's an, let me back up, sorry. Here's an example of a Be'ir in the Negev. Okay, this kind of thing is still done today. Here's a Be'ir, here's a, here's a, a, a desert watering hole in India. They still practice the same art today. Here in Egypt are two Egyptians digging this kind of thing in the middle of the desert. We're not talking about <laughs> this kind of well. <laughs> now we see the word well, we default to our concept, we have to ask the question, how is the Hebrew word functioning? What was the culture? Now this, this one's interesting because this is a well at a site close to Beersheba called Tel Arad, the city of Arad. And this well actually was dug at the bottom of it. It was originally dug by the Canaanites a thousand years before Abraham. Then you've got three different levels after that uh, to the modern period. But if the Canaanites could dig this kind of thing a thousand years before Abraham and it got built up and built up and built up, why could Abraham have not done this out of the middle of the desert in the site that later became this well at Beersheba? So there's our wells. So those are our wells. So we've been on camels, and I've learned that there are one hump and two hump camels. camels. I will never forget it. That's right. And you okay. learned that there are two types of wells. Two types of wells. That's right. If I ever need water in the Negev, I know where to go. That's okay. Right. No, dig, <laughs> dig a hole. That's or right. make exactly a well. right. Okay. So now we're down to uh, Philistines or Greeks, Greeks in the land. Camels, all right. Greeks, and the ears. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So Genesis talks about Abraham and Isaac encountering Philistines in the land. Uh, one group of Philistines is a city of Gerar. Now this becomes an issue because the Philistines were part of the Sea Peoples who invaded Canaan and the ancient Eastern world about 1200 BC. It's about a thousand years after Abraham. So how could Philistines have been in Canaan a thousand years before the Philistines came to Canaan? Okay, that, that becomes an issue. Sounds like a problem. Sounds like a problem. Yeah. yeah. Here's a picture of the Philistines as part of the Sea Peoples invading the ancient world about 1200 BC. Well known, without question, and the area that we call the city of pa the area of Palestine is where the Philistines were. About 1200, it's a thousand years after Abraham. But people from that same area, see where they're coming from, the Mycenae, people from the same area came to the coast of Canaan about a thousand years before that, did invade, but they were there for trade. They had a couple of small towns, not very well known. They're not called Philistines at that point. They'd be Mycenaeans, Aegeans, Greeks, but they're there. We've got the right stuff in the right place at the right time. Now, the city that the Philistines are said to dwell in in Genesis is called Gaar. 
Gerar has been excavated. It's Tel Harar. Excavators found that the city of Gerar was built about 2200 BC, right at the time of Abraham. And guess who the major inhabitants were? Greeks, Mycenaeans, Aegeans, who later the Israelites would call them Philistines, but they're the right folks at the right place. Here's where Gerar was at, or Harar was at, uh, Tel Harar, Gerar, close to Gaza. Here's the site. Here's some of the pottery. It's Aegean style, Greek style pottery. It's distinctive. It's not Canaanite pottery. It's Philistine Greek style pottery. So you've got the right stuff in the right place at the right time. Wow, that was impressive. Okay, so we did camels. Camels. We did water Greeks. wells. Well, water wells. And then we did Greeks. We and did Greeks. That's right. So those were three examples of anachronism. Now, one of the things that you deal with when you deal with historical reliability is kind of not only dealing with the challenges that people raise, but they're also is thinking through the material that you actually have and what it actually tells us. So now we're switching gears. And Bob, you're going to help us with this. Um, what, what, uh, what can we say positively about the portrait of, of Genesis? And what besides camels, water wells, and uh, Philistines do we need to be thinking about when we think of the book of Genesis? Okay, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on what you just said. Okay. And I want to say, you can tell Gordon is our ace. <laughs> He's our first starter for you baseball fans. <laughs> I'm coming along as probably a fourth starter on this. Yeah. But, uh, no, you're the closer, man. Oh, okay, I'll take that. Yeah, okay. take that. But, but yeah. we need him because he makes it clear. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, but yeah, just to elaborate a little bit on what you just said, mm -hmm. uh, lots of times we are counterpunching. You know, they'll say, well, this couldn't have happened in this time period. And what we're showing is, yes, it could have. But in many of these examples, uh, the situation described could be true in the time period that we're focusing on, but other time periods as well. Uh, and so it's, it, it could have taken place in that period, but we can't prove it. But what we can sometimes do is find features in the story that are distinctive to the time period. Uh, and I want to recommend a book for you. Um, it won't be the kind of thing that you will sit down and uh, read like a novel, but it will be a great reference book for you. And it's written by the great K.A. Kitchen, Kenneth Kitchen, and it's called On the Reliability of the Old Testament. And he goes through the entire Old Testament and he's working with primary sources and showing that the Old Testament is reliable in these matters. And he documents everything from primary sources. And so there's a lot of detail and it can get a little dull at times. But if you face a question from, you know, a college student comes home from uh, college and says, my professor said this, you might want to check out Kitchen and send that student to K.A. Kitchen. And I would just love to be there when the student brings it up to the professor. <laughs> um, because Kitchen makes it pretty clear that mainstream scholarship sometimes just ignores or misses some of, some of these facts. Um, let, he, me, let, me, let me raise a question here because I think it's an important point that you're making. And that is that, that as we engage with these distinctions, and particularly as there are certain things that people are not aware of, there's, there's a way to tell uh, this story that, that is, and what you're saying in effect, positive. That we're mm -hmm, actually yeah. marking out the text for things that only fit the period we're in question. Give a couple and, and you're dealing with, in the university context, people who are called minimalists. Mm -hmm. You might explain who the minimalists are, because that book is written in a maximal way to deal with the minimalists. Yeah, I'll let Gordon talk about minimalists. I think he knows a little more about them with more specificity than but Chris. Well, there's, there's, <laughs> we have to realize there's an agenda. Uh, in mainstream scholarship, there's an agenda away from the Bible, uh, because there's a desire to try to explain the Bible historically, culturally, without the supernatural, and, specific, and, and particularly they want to be able to try to refute critical events, the exodus, Israel's entrance into the land, the united monarchy. Okay, okay so why are they called minimalists? Because what they're going to do is they're going to argue for a minimum of integration, a minimum of correlation between the Bible and archaeology and history. We would be maximalists because we're assuming and looking for a maximum amount mm -hmm. of integration and harmonization. Okay, and so that book is kind of a maximalist uh, oh, compendium of stuff. it's definitely a maximalist uh, <laughs> uh, approach. And, and it's really carrying on the tradition of the great archaeologists of the mid-20th century, Albright and uh, Bright and you know, G.E. Wright and the fellows that uh, studied under him. 
there's kind of been a reaction to them. Mm -hmm. They were more maximalist. And sometimes mm -hmm. they overstated. Yeah, that's, they did. Sometimes they drew correlations where maybe there weren't. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there's been a reaction to that. And there's a political side to this. Mm -hmm. you want to get into this now? Well, let's tell your, let's see oh, let's the, do, let's look the, at the uniqueness yeah. first. And then, yeah. and then you play your trump becoming, card. You're a closer, yeah. OK? And the last it. out <laughs> comes last, yeah, OK? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I got to get the last three guys. Yeah, exactly yeah. right, OK. Yeah. Um, but Kitchen has a list, by the way, of about 10 features of the patriarchal narratives that are very authentic. And he documents all of this from primary sources. But uh, at least a couple of them, um, you look at it and you say, wow, the evidence is distinctive to the right time and mm -hmm. the right place. It wouldn't fit anywhere else. And a critic can't have it both ways. He can't say that the text is littered with anachronisms and then argue that in some cases it's archaizing. It's trying to make it look period. No, it looks period because it is period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, we can deal with the anachronisms, but there are a couple of these. And one uh, of the points that he makes is his ninth point um, on the geopolitical profile of the area. Okay. And so he points out... A geopolitical profile, what in the what, world is that? Well, we're going to explain oh, okay. you know, All right. what people are living there and how the political okay. uh, structure of the, of the land works and, and all of that. So uh, I'm, I'm going to get there. Okay, all right. Uh, and so he points out in the 12th and 11th centuries, you know, when you're back in the judges' about, about period. a thousand years after Abraham. Yeah, yeah, a thousand years after Abraham. Canaan is divided up between the Philistines. They are there as a major force. You know when you're reading through Judges and Samuel that the Philistines are a factor. They're a major force. Uh, you have your hill country residents, and Israel is there as a nation uh, and uh, trying to survive. Uh, and you have Canaanites on the coastal plain. Um, and, but in the patriarchal narratives, when you move back uh, into that time period, it really is not the Canaan of this later period. It's Canaan as we know it from an earlier period. Uh, in fact, the period where the Bible puts it. Uh, and so there's no major Egyptian presence, and we know that there was later uh, in Canaan. There's no what he calls overall monarchies, you know, no large monarchies that are dominating territory. Uh, no Philistine pentapolis, you know, the five cities of the Philistines. We really don't have that in the patriarchal period. We've got this Semitized Abimelech in Gerar, uh, who's one of these Mycenaeans, you know, who's, who's moved in there and has settled down, but we don't have a major Philistine presence uh, in the patriarchal stories. And furthermore, uh, what we see is we've got some city-states uh, and we've got rulers of those cities, but we've also got rulers of like these semi-nomadic people. Uh, we could call them sheiks, maybe, or tribal chieftains. And they're around the land. That's what Abraham is. That's what Isaac is. Uh, and in the Egyptian ex execration texts, which come from 19th century, that's exactly the way they portray Canaan at this point in time. Uh, and there's a story of Sinue, who is this Egyptian, and he is helped by these pastoralists, these Asiatic pastoralists. He's thirsty and wandering around, and they help him. Uh, and when you read that story, you could look at the, the guys who help him, these Asiatics who are kind of semi-nomadic moving around, and say, that could be Abraham. Mm -hmm. That could be Isaac. So Kitchen's point is the patriarchal narratives fit early Canaan, early second millennium as only, we know. Uh, only, only that. Yes, right, yeah, yeah. If, <clears throat> if it were anachronistic, we'd have Philistines all over the place. There would be a different geopolitical structure uh, in place. And so it fits really only in that period. And not with, the uh, not the later. And period. with Sinewe, it's important because we know the, the the Egyptian king that he was under. We're talking about 1950 yeah. BC. Senusrit. Yeah. Abraham is around 2000 BC. I mean, you're right within yeah. that time frame. Mm -hmm. So, and, and part of the point is uh, just to flip it a little bit is the idea is if this were written later, they wouldn't know about the different cultural conditions that existed earlier. Or be they, they'd be unlikely to know about yeah. it, and they and the fact that they don't portray, they portray it in a way that fits uniquely this period shows that at least this material is coming out of it's this period. It's sourced in, 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 in an earlier period. Yeah, if we say Moses is using sources, he has sources that are reliable, accurate from that earlier period that reflect 
the context of the earlier period. They're oh. just not making stories up and letting no. their own culture bleed into it by not a bunch of anachronisms. Exactly. It's period. It fits the period. You yeah. mean Abe doesn't have a boom box? <laughs> <laughs> no, apparently not. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, yeah. And then another he also talks about Joseph. He has hmm. a special section on Joseph Kitchen does where he talks about how the Joseph story is very authentic and fits the period in which the Bible places it. Uh, and one of the interesting facts that he brings up is the price of slaves. Remember, Joseph was sold into slavery. Uh, and the price uh, for Joseph was 20 shekels. That's what his brothers got for him. Is that a going right for slaves? In that uh, well, at, this, at this period, it was. Okay. Uh, that's oh. the point. Oh, okay. Uh, Kitchen has investigated slave prices in the ancient Near East. Uh, throughout the history. Someone has way too much time. <laughs> he was, well, Kitchen was a single man. He was. <laughs> I understand why. <laughs> he's a leading Egyptologist, by the way. He's on our yeah. side, but yeah. he's a leading Egyptologist recognized in, in uh, Britain. I think he's at the University of Liverpool. The guy sight reads hieroglyphs. <laughs> yeah, okay. I would expect him to. That's what happens if you're single that long. You start sight reading so, hieroglyphs. Um, but what he, he, in his investigation of slave prices throughout the ancient Near East, he goes back to an earlier time period. And this just gives you a feel for how the attention to detail that he uh, brings to the table. Uh, in earlier times, under the third dynasty of Ur, 10 shekels was the commonest price. Two thirds of the known cases within the eight to 10 shekel pre uh, range. But prices could vary widely depending on circumstances. See, so he's investigated all of this. Uh, and then we get down to the 20 shekels at just the right time with Joseph. A little bit after this, as we move further along in the second millennium, the price goes up to uh, an average of about 30 or more. So it's inflation. He uses that word. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, by the time we're in the first millennium, uh, male slaves uh, in Assyria are 50 to 60 shekels. Uh, it's uh, and too it's interesting for me. In 2 Kings 15, uh, where Menachem had to pay Assyria to get some of his people back, that's the price he paid. It mm. fits the period, mm. but it doesn't fit the earlier period with Joseph. And then it, the price just seems to escalate. Under the Persian Empire, it gets to 90, even as high as 120. And so if this is Israel making up these stories, uh, and there are all kinds of anachronisms that we can use to tell that the story's being made up, and, and uh, later uh, cultural phenomena are being projected into this uh, earlier uh, alleged period, um, why would the slave price be exactly right? How would they know that way late? Say. So his argument is it fits that period and that period only. Okay, so we got two outs, right? We got one left. And okay, that's that's all the, I'm bringing to the table. Well, well, except well, no, no, <laughs> I mean, no, no, I got no, a whole list no, no, here. no, no. You had the geo, you had the political uh, uh, implications of all this and the minimal, minimal. Oh, the uh, said, political, the yeah, current political yeah, yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, here, here's what we're facing, and we have colleagues in Old Testament who teach in Denmark and they've told us about their experiences in this regard. Uh, you know, there's a lot of tension these days, Palestinian versus Israeli and that sort of thing. And so uh, some minimalists are using this, this information to uh, promote the theory that Israel's history is concocted. You know, it's made up. Uh, and if, uh, if you can sort of undermine the reliability of the patriarchal accounts and Old Testament history, then guess who doesn't have a right to the land anymore? Yeah. Okay. And so they view it positively as if we can just get people to get away from these legends, maybe we can do something constructive over there. If people would just give up this notion that they have a right to the land. Um, and so that, that's a very practical, current uh, way that this material comes into, uh, into play. And know? so from a, uh, obviously from a cultural engagement standpoint, what this means is, is that um, not only sometimes does our study of the scripture relate directly to what's going on in scripture, but it also spills over into the way mm -hmm. it's being utilized in conversations that we have about, about um, realities that people are facing and things that they're debating mm -hmm. today so that so that camels and water wells and philistines and 
geopolitical realities of the time of Abraham. Slave prices. Slave prices. Um, all have something to tell yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention the fact that in the typical university classroom, many professors are going to attempt to undermine the historicity of the Bible and appeal to these kinds of uh, um, you know, features in the story. Now, we have, uh, as we often do for these chapels, microphones set up. So uh, if there are questions, um, we're off and running. <laughs> There's Steve. Hi, Steve. First of all, thank you. Uh, I'm so grateful for not only your intellect, but the time that you spend uh, doing this. And uh, it's helpful to me. Um, I assume neither of you have Netflix accounts because I wouldn't be able to do this. But, um, <laughs> what, what's that mean? Netflix. Netflix. It's movies. Oh, we're Netflix. explaining Netflix no. to Dr. Chisholm. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly who it is. So what happens? Why do we have a Netflix he, he doesn't think that we have time for movies. Look it up. Oh, what, what, oh, happens at, yeah. what happens at home? <laughs> what actually happens at home is we this watch. This is called translation. Yeah. Okay. At well, home, my I watch a hockey I, game every yeah. night. This time. <laughs> we go, every night I watch a hockey game. We we look at sports and then we look at dusty stuff and then we look at movies and then we look at dusty stuff. <laughs> suddenly so I'm, we do have a life. Suddenly I'm much more afraid of my. They Hebrew have much more diversity week. than you do, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did have a question. Okay. It, uh, I've been I've been indoctrinated by several uh, professors uh, who are fideists and presuppositionalists, and asked the same question. I think your wife asked in a different way. They would say people believe that God, uh, the Bible, is God's word based on faith, not so much facts and evidence. I was wondering if you could speak to how you see all of this research influencing faith. Yeah, so a couple years ago, my wife is talking to one of her friends who's not a Christian, and she's trying to evangelize her. And he, she asked her, her unsafe friend asked her questions like this. She comes, so I come home one night and she says, okay, tell me, Mr. Old Testament scholar. Tell me about camels. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with this? <laughs> And so we have these kind of conversations. Now these are not conversations, I've learned not to bring up these conversations. They're boring. <laughs> but when she's got a need to know, when people have a need to know, they're very interested. So she asked me, she says, so how long have you known about this? About 15 years. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you didn't want to know. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's an important <clears throat> dynamic here that, because sometimes within Christian circles we get a debate between what's called the presuppositionalists who approach apologetics in one way and the evidentialists who work with this kind of material. It's almost as if those two things are, uh, should, are in con conflict with one another. Sometimes it's presented that way, which is a little bit unfortunate. Here's what I think is going on, it's important to remember, and, and it's this. From one standpoint, the Bible, as the Word of God, stands on its own. It has the imprimatur of God's presence and power and understanding wrapped up within it. Uh, and so for a presuppositionalist, it's, it's an insult to the Bible and an insult to God to try and defend it. God doesn't need defending. And so you just present it and people are accountable, and that's the way um, that approach generally speaking works a little oversimplification I'll probably get letters from them but that's, that's uh, but anyway but then the evidentialist comes along and says now wait a minute the moment you say the Bible says to someone who's not a believer uh, it's not a warrant for them it's not an authority it's not a source they they want to know or begin to know why they should even care about the scripture and what it has to say that kind of thing and so what this material does is it, it's designed to what I call give pause to the person who has never thought about the Bible seriously and to say there's some things here that fit that tell us that the story and the contents within it are worth paying attention to and seeing what they're all about and that's the evidentialist side of the equation if you will and um, and so one of the shifts that's happened culturally, of course, is, is that we used to have a Judeo-Christian net in our culture underneath what are, uh, even a superficiality Judeo-Christian presence. And so if you said the Bible, the Bible had a, a respect given to it that um, I think, generally speaking, is less, certainly less the case mm -hmm. now. And that is what this stuff helps us with. And it isn't isolated. Um, these specials that show up, particularly at Christmas and Easter, yeah. are seen by millions of people at the same time. 
And for someone who never darkens the door of a church, their understanding of religion and history is framed by those documentaries and what gets said in them and what gets presented in them. So you as a minister of the word, wherever you're ministering, whether it be in a, in a junior high or high school group or a university group or even in the context of the main service when you're talking about pastors and that kind of, sometimes we'll find these questions coming up. Now I'm not saying you should go out and preach a sermon every week on the themes of apologetics like this, but what I am saying is this, an awareness of this is actually very important because now and again when someone brings a question that's been in the public square and you show there is a coherent response. Um, you, you do something positive in thinking about how uh, the scripture is seen. Real the, quick, can I, can I yeah. add, I, we'll get to the yeah. question. Uh, I've actually experienced this doing evangelism. I was doing evangelism at the Denton Arts Festival and um, there was a fellow, he was kind of watching and I saw him and I go, <laughs> and he came over, he goes, and I started to share the gospel with him. He goes, and I said, I, you, you take the Bible seriously, huh? I go, yeah, I do. And he says, well, you know, I was reading this book about uh, how Israelite religion evolved from monotheism. You know, there were, there were these gods, Yam is the way he said the name, Yam. And I said, oh, you're talking about the uh, theory that Israelite religion evolved out of Ugaritic uh, Canaanite myth. It's Yamu, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I knew about this. You know, I teach about it. Yeah, we, we teach about it in OTI. And... So I took about 10 minutes and engaged him and explained to him, he'd read this book and he was looking at the evidence the way it had been laid out by the author of the book and what I did, I took that same evidence and explained it a different way. And it was like a light came on, he goes, wow, that's really interesting. He says, you've, you've just given me a whole different way of looking at this. Now that that shield was down, mm -hmm. Can we take the Bible seriously? Now that the shield's down, I jumped right in. I said, now let's talk about your sin and what Jesus did about it. Because <laughs> I don't play around. <laughs> that was and, the day a new... He, he became receptive. He listened. Yeah, that was the day needed somebody a to... new doctrine was invented, Yamu Atonement. <laughs> <laughs> From yeah, Yamu so to anyway, Atonement yeah, yeah. sounds like a title of a yeah. best-selling book But it to was me. amazing to me that yeah. the Lord brought him Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. I mean, divine the providence. Person, yeah, that's the only right. person in Dallas. I mean, who else <laughs> at the Denton Art Festival that uh, day could have engaged him on this, and the Lord brought him right to me. Wow. Like a tractor beam. You know, I just went like <laughs> And he heard the gospel. Yeah. Ilya. So for some people, the, it's the historical side, uh, which I think in some circles today is not as accessible because people will get lost in the debate. But I think the, the ethical issues with the Old Testament have a lot to do also with the unreliability of the Old Testament mm -hmm. as an informative text. So how do we approach that side um, to, for the people that might not really care about the historical issues but are looking at the ethics of the Old Testament? Great, as, great question, and, and this is a chance for me to do a plug. Yeah, we got a uh, we, chapel for that. We, we, did a cha we did an entire chapel a couple of years ago on genocide in the Old Testament, which is we spent uh, the same amount of time we're spending now on camels on genocide, okay, because we're committed to thrilling you in chapel. And, uh, uh, and, we, and we talked through not only the ethical dimensions of the question the way it gets raised, but also the lesson and the application that comes out of the fact that it happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that says about how seriously God takes sin and accountability and those kinds of themes and ideas. It's, it, it, is, it is the most, I think for many people it's the most difficult hurdle in relationship to the Old Testament. Uh, the ethical issues that are raised by, you know, the fact that they were told to go in and wipe out everyone in the land. Uh, but we looked at the really peculiar set of circumstances that, that caused that command to be given and, um, and also reflected looking back on what happened as a result of not executing that command. And so, um, uh, so yes, that's a very, very important fe feature of the total picture, and it's something that uh, is a part of the conversation because obviously once you start talking about the reliability of Scripture, you're not only talking about the history side of things, but in some cases there are uh, ethical issues that are raised in the Scripture that also raise questions. And the thing that most 
people who, gr who have grown up in the church all their life are not aware of is how much this stuff gets talked about in university contexts, in university campuses, in religion courses. They're not called Christianity and Judaism courses. They're usually, um, they're usually religion titled as religion courses of one kind or another. Sometimes it's Second Temple Judaism and that kind of thing. Um, that, and all this stuff is raised. You know, we, we talk a lot on this campus about people like Bart Ehrman, but Bart Ehrman has written the most popular introduction to the New Testament text used in university campuses across the country, and it's published by Oxford University Press. So, um, so this stuff is real and out there, and people are aware of it, and what people do is they grab onto these um, issues as a way of creating their what I call their anti-Bible lists. Yeah. And in the midst of that, um, uh, they drop these little nuggets on their Christian friends who share with them as a way of inoculating them, them from the conversation. How do I know that? Because I used to be one. I used to be someone who didn't believe. I didn't come to faith until I was in my, in my college years. And whenever anyone got too close with me with the Bible, there were certain questions that I could ask that I knew would deflect them. Some of them would be the problems in the Bible set of questions. The other was I had a terrific compassion for Africans who never heard about Christ. And the moment, I, moment anything got close, I'd send that question. And they were talking about people in Africa and not about me anymore, and I was grateful. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I think that uh, understanding how those kinds of conversations work is an important part of this, and reliability is but one feature of it. Well, our, our time is gone. Let's thank our uh, <laughs> participants. I, I'm rather confident that you will not think of camels quite the same way. <laughs> yeah, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for um, just the opportunity to reflect on your word to see um, literally the footprints and bone prints that you've left that allow us to see um, how this creation that was designed by you has worked over a long period of time. We do thank you for the people who have dedicated their lives in one way to searching out these little facts, this minutia, that at the surface looks like, oh, it's fascinating and interesting, but what really role does it have? And to see that there actually is uh, some uh, practical value that comes out of it. We thank you for people who dedicate their lives to those kinds of, of efforts. And I thank you for my colleagues who I could email and they would be ready to respond. Equip us to not only teach and preach your word, but to know how to give a defense for the hope that is within us. And we thank you for the one who is defended in it, uh, not only you, your son, and the spirit, who, in, who by their presence and power show your care. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.